questions that have framed an enduring divide in modern America. And the Supreme Court has overturned Roe v. Wade. Whether states can prosecute uh, people for going across state lines. A federal judge in Texas is hearing arguments in a case that could jeopardize access to abortion pills. Now that you've unearthed the entire roots and the foundations of, of 30, 40 years of constitutional law, everything is up for grabs. Aw, do not tell me y'all believed them when they told you they'd stop an abortion. Oh no, you believe them with the state's rights, pro-life, and all that other bibbity bibbity bullshit they was talking about. <laughs> I hate love to be the one to tell you, but that's cap. It is cap. The right to an abortion was the law of the land for 50 years, and the vast majority of the country liked it that way. In fact, today, 85% of the country supports abortion in most or all cases. <laughs> but do you think that stopped the Mickey Mouse operation we call a Supreme Court from rolling in like the jalopy they are and overturning Roe versus Wade? Curling us into the dark times we find ourselves in now and destroying 50 years of precedent? It didn't. Since the overturning of Roe versus Wade, abortion has been totally banned in 15 states and severely restricted in 17. If you believe in naming and shaming, well, Maybe, so do I. Let's gather around the campfire and sing our campfire song. Idaho, Wyoming, South Dakota, Oklahoma, Arizona, Utah, Mississippi, Georgia, Alabama, Wisconsin, Tennessee, Kentucky, Missouri, West Virginia, Louisiana, Texas, Arkansas, Florida. <laughs> That's cool, boys, nigga. I'm a lawyer. Not a musician. But wait, folks, that's not all. Not only are about half of all states ultimately expected to adopt new abortion restrictions, but according to US News, medication abortion has already become a battlefront with anti-abortion groups filing a lawsuit seeking to pull one of the drugs used in the procedure from the market. The battle over medication abortion, which accounts for more than half of all abortions in the United States, is likely to expand in the coming year. Demand surge for shipments of abortion pills from overseas in the wake of Dobbs, which is the name of the case where Roe versus Wade was overturned. And conservative states could pass laws aimed at cracking down on such shipments. And listen, maybe you don't care about abortion or what happens to people who don't have access to them. But do you care about yourself, nigga? Because our rights are literally tied together. I mean that in the literal sense, not the philosophical one. What am I talking about? Well, it's time for a little something called I went to law school so you don't have to. Welcome to Constitutional Law 101 with Olay. Everyone has heard of Roe versus Wade, but far less people have heard about Griswold versus Connecticut. And that's where the right to an abortion and a host of other rights comes from. Griswold versus Connecticut, which is a case that was decided in 1965, created for us what they call the penumbra of rights. Picture it like a family tree with Griswold at the top. In Griswold versus Connecticut, on behalf of a married couple who had been found guilty of violating a statute that forbid people from getting contraception for the purposes of preventing conception and forbid physicians from selling it, a physician challenged the constitutionality of that law. The court found that the law was unconstitutional not because it violated one particular constitutional provision, but because it violated the spirit of them all. The court asserted that the entirety of the Bill of Rights has a penumbra formed by emanation from those guarantees that helps give them life and substance and that those guarantees create the zone of privacy. The court found that before the Constitution, we always possess the right to privacy as human beings. It's a natural right, meaning the right to make decisions in our intimate and personal lives and the Constitution could not be construed to deny or disparage that fundamental right to privacy. And two years after Griswold, that's how we got the right to interracial marriage in Loving versus Virginia in 1967, when Mildred and Richard Loving, an interracial couple who had been criminally charged and jailed in Virginia for their marriage, challenged the constitutionality of anti-miscegenation laws in Virginia. Then, five years after that, we got the right to an abortion in Roe versus Wade, where the court determined that Texas statutes prohibiting abortions violated the right to privacy found in the penumbras of rights they recognized in Griswold. Also, how gay people got the right to have sex with each other in Lawrence versus Texas in 1990, because believe it or not, it was very much so criminalized to be gay in recent memory. Lawrence versus Texas overturned a case called Bowers versus Hardwick, a Supreme Court decision where the court determined that there was no constitutional protection or right afforded to gay people to have sex under the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. 
But in Lawrence versus Texas, using the penumbra of rights they recognized in Griswold, the court found that liberty presumes an autonomy of self that includes freedom of thought, belief, expressions, and certain intimate conduct. Speaking of LGBT rights, Griswold is also how we got the right to gay marriage in Obergefell versus Hodges. So we truly have a host of civil liberties that hang in the balance once Roe was overturned. Anybody tells you otherwise? Well, you cannot trick me. Quick little lesson to make this next part easier to understand. The Supreme Court doesn't need to rule unanimously. Majority rules, so whatever the majority votes for wins out, and one of the justice in the majority is selected to write what's called the majority opinion. That's the decision. Justices who voted in the majority but have a different reasoning or just a little bit of a two cents they want to put in are free to write what's called a concurrence. And justices who didn't vote in the majority are in the dissent and can author what's called a dissenting opinion. In Dobbs versus Jackson, the case that overturned Roe versus Wade, there was a majority opinion authored by Justice Alito, a concurrence written by Justice Clarence Thomas, and Justices Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan wrote a joint dissenting opinion. In Dobbs versus Jackson, the dissenting justice explicitly warned the country that the justices in the majority overturning Roe versus Wade would be coming for the other rights recognized by the penumbra of rights in Griswold. They said, and I quote, no one should be confident that the majority is done with its work. The right Roe and Casey recognized does not stand alone. To the contraire, the court has linked it for decades to other settled freedoms involving bodily integrity, familial relationships, and procreation. Most obviously, the right to terminate a pregnancy arose straight out of the right to purchase and use contraception in Griswold. Writing for the majority, Alito weakly attempted to convince us that overturning Roe doesn't concern the other precedents it's anchored in. But the dissenting justices called he and the majority out for this flawed reasoning as either dishonest or hypocritical. They stated explicitly, the majority is eager to tell us today that nothing it does cast doubt on precedents that do not concern abortion. But how could that be? The lone rationale for what the majority does today is that the right to elect an abortion is not deeply rooted in history. The majority argues that until Roe, people did not think abortion fell within the Constitution's guarantee of liberty. Well, the same could be said of most of the rights the majority claims it's not tampering with. The majority could write just as long an opinion showing, for example, that until the mid 20th century, there was no support in American law for a constitutional right to obtain contraceptives. So one of two things must be true. Either the majority does not believe its own reasoning, or if it does, all rights that have no history stretching back to the mid 19th century are insecure. Either the mass of the majority's opinion is hypocrisy or additional constitutional rights are under threat. It is one or the other. That's the dissenting justice's words, not mine. But if you still doubted the reality that all the rights we got under the Griswold penumbra were in danger, coon ass Clarence Thomas said, don't hurt your head thinking about it, sweetie. I'll save you the time. We coming for that ass. I'm coming for that ass again. In his concurrence, Clarence Thomas explicitly said that the court had a duty to correct the error, that is Griswold versus Connecticut's right to privacy, and every right that flows from it. More specifically, he lists the right to contraceptives, the right to same-sex marriage, and the right to same-sexual relationships, except for one right he left off his list. And what do y'all think that right is? My milk of magnesium. Oh. You guessed it, baby. The right to interracial marriages recognized in Loving versus Virginia. Because y'all know he don't play about his milk of magnesia, the MAGA mama herself, Miss Jenny Thomas, baby. White man play you like he play Sega. He play you, this is you. He ain't even got to be in the hood, he got this. He played Negroes like this. Our rights are in danger. That is the simple truth of the matter because it's all connected. That's why you can't see being an ally to other marginalized communities as doing them a favor or something you can't be bothered with. And instead, see the interconnected struggles because our rights are literally all hanging on by the same constitutional thread. That's why after they went after abortion, they then went after gender affirming care and LGBT people and they are working their way right to you. So while this time our conch shell of the week might be this raggedy ass Supreme Court, if we don't get our heads in the game and stop letting Republicans trick and propagandize you into opposing the LGBT community and supporting their bullshit that helps them come after all our rights, the next conch shell of the week could very well be us. Today's animal fact is brought to you by my beloved Bahamaland. 
Do you know what a pot cake is? A pot cake is what we call a stray dog in the Bahamas and they are beloved by all. <laughs>